Yo guys and gals, Bytor back with some new content for ya. Like always, if you are a recurrent subscriber, welcome back to the channel. I truly appreciate you being here and I hope you're making the most out of this resource. If you are a new subscriber, welcome. Please start from the first video and work your way through all of them as you will learn valuable information. One short announcement. Thank you to all our members for spreading the word about this resource. Our team is happy to help you guys and build a community for resources on interviewing for hardware and electronics. Maybe we will expand on the future. If you haven't done so yet, please recommend us to your friends and relatives as they may find these resources extremely helpful. If you can share it on social media, reddit boards, etc. We would really, really appreciate and I'm sure they will as well. So let's take a look at today's content. Oh, this next question is a classic and in 2021, also a staple of lazy interviewing. We will walk through it because it is a classic and it is simple. However, this will be the foundation to variations of this question that will truly test the candidate. Let's face it, if in 2021 you are still being asked this question, then you will know that the interviewer is either lazy or technically weak. You don't want to work for a company where the interviewer is technically weak, believe me. I mean. What does that say about the overall team or even worse, overall the company when the interviewer is technically weak? Technically weak people will hire technically weak candidates, period. Okay, enough of that. Let's move on to the actual problem. Like always, the interviewer will either show you the following circuit or will ask you to draw it. Now, I know you saw it and you said, oh my gosh, I have seen this problem many times. Or if you're completely new and you're a recent college grad, you probably haven't seen it. But it's a boring question and the question will be something like this. Imagine switch 1 and switch 2 are controlled by non-overlapping clocks and the voltage supply is 5 volts. Also, assume that both C1 and C2 are initially discharged. When switch 1 closes, what's the voltage across C1 and C2? To which, of course, you will say 5 volts across C1 and 0 across C2. That's fairly obvious, right? If you can't defend the answer, check out the video linked in the description below. After defending the question, the interviewer will now ask, what about when the switch 1 opens and switch 2 closes? What is the voltage across C1 and C2? Be aware that another way of asking the same question is to have only one switch and assume that capacitor 1 is already charged and has 5 volts across it. Then, what would happen if we close the switch? That's basically the same question. But of course, our team interviews regularly, both as interviewers and interviewees. So we set this question up so that we can spice it up with a follow up on it. Please pause, take a moment to answer the question, and then watch the rest of the video. Side note, if this is where the interviewer ends the question and doesn't post anything more challenging on this topic, I would really reconsider working there, or even the interviewer. Anyway, let's explore that answer. All right, let's remember that we assume non-overlapping clocks. That means that by the time switch two closes, switch one has been open for quite a while. So let's look at that time in between where both switch one and switch two are open. That means we have a capacitor that is dangling and it's fully charged to five volts. Well, capacitor two is also dangling, but it has zero volts across it. This means that capacitor one has a charge of C1 times delta V across that capacitor that is five volts. Now, if we look at the time where the switch closes and we're shorting both capacitors, now we have two capacitors in parallel. Remember that when we have any two elements in parallel, the voltage drop across them must be the same. So in this case, since capacitor one was fully charged to five volts and capacitor two was discharged and had zero volts across it, then we have a discrepancy five volts cannot be equal to zero volts. The way to approach this problem is actually to say we had the initial charge of capacitor one to be C1 times five volts. And now since we have two capacitors in parallel, 
we can form a new capacitor, an equivalent capacitor. This equivalent capacitor is nothing more than C1 plus C2. And because of the principle of conservation of charge, meaning that once we have this ideal circuit, the charge cannot simply disappear. That means that the charge for this equivalent capacitor must be the same as the charge on capacitor one. We can rewrite that the charge in capacitor one is equal to the effective capacitance times the delta V across this effective capacitance. In other words, C1 times five volts is equal to C1 plus C2 times the delta V across this equivalent capacitor. Let's also remember that if we have the equivalent capacitor with a certain voltage drop or a certain delta V, that delta V is the same once we have the parallel capacitors instead of the effective capacitance. So reworking this equation, we have that C1 times five volts divided by C1 plus C2 is equal to delta V across the effective capacitor. So that means that after charge sharing occurs through these capacitors, the new voltage will settle at a lower voltage than the original five volts across C1. And that new voltage will be dictated by C1 divided by C1 plus C2 times those five volts. But also remember that the total charge across the circuit is the charge originally held by the charge in C1. On the next episode, we will explore the natural way to spice up this question. It's still rather simple, but it will lay the foundation so that in further episodes, we can show variations of this problem that will make it slightly more challenging and will make you think about how capacitors actually work.